I thought it would be interesting to talk about Diplodocus soft tissue. I've already shared about the Gallagher et al. 2021 paper when I reviewed the reborn Diplodocus, so please have a look at that. For today, I'll share some of my quick takeaways from it. First, the paper tells us that skin detail can vary in even small regions. In skin found in association with two ribs, Gallagher et al. identified at least six types of scale. You have the polygonal, which is the commonest type, the default as it were. They range in size from 5 to 10 millimeters. The pebble, these are the smallest at 1 to 2 millimeters. The rectangular, which are 2 to 10 millimeters. The globular, irregularly shaped, without defined angles or consistent patterning, with more prominent relief than the previous ones. The ovoid, the larger scales, measuring about 10 millimeters in length. Now these are clustered together with their pointed ends in the same direction and have the most prominent 3D relief of all the scales. And the dome. Now two are found, one 5mm and the other smaller, and both with prominent 3D relief. Now second, while these were identified, their exact locations couldn't be determined, only educated speculation. For example, B2 presents a notched alignment, reminiscent of the scale patterning on an alligator's hind limb, hinting that this patch may have come from the same region. In addition, smaller scales allow for more flexible skin, and so are likelier to be where movement occurs. Larger ones are more realistically found where less mobility is required. Now third, notice the minuscule size of these scales. For 1 to 35, here are the equivalent sizes. Now capturing all of it would be ridiculously impossible, with the smallest being equivalent to a flawed dust particle, while the largest you could see would be only found in a few areas, with everywhere else looking like naked skin. Most of us know this, but we still appreciate finely sculpted scales, while knowing much of it would still be too big for true 1 to 35, so model makers include them. A nod to the various shapes would be nice, but as long as a model makes logical sense and respects the idea that scales across different regions aren't homogenous, I'm not too fussed on accuracy, simply because you can't capture this. Now what I haven't talked about before are these dermal spines which have become the norm. When you look at older illustrations, you don't see them. But now it's a common inclusion, at least in diplodocenes, and the first time I saw this was in a Walking with Dinosaurs series, by which I mean the one and only 1999 version. And some of you have asked me where this came from. As far as I know, a primary contributor to this idea would be this article by Cherkas in 1992 regarding sauropod finds from Hao Quarry in the USA. Now, partial diplodocid bones were found in association with many conical or spine-like elements. Some were isolated, while others were connected, indicating a continuous line. At that time, these bones were thought to belong to immature Diplodocus or Barosaurus, though we now know that at least some of it belonged to Cartodocus. Back to those elements. Now it's important to clarify that these aren't osteoderms, as they lack an osseous core, but were probably entirely keratinous. Here are some dermal spines in situ, and here, the actual fragments out of the matrix. The outlines are a generalization based on other spines found. For example, here's one that shows a pointed tip. Note that the skin impressions actually only support the presence of these dorsal midline spines along the whiplash part of the tail. However, extrapolating from hadrosaurs, Cherka surmised they likely continued up the body and neck, and reconstructed as such in this diagram. And since then, most reconstructions have followed this idea, including of course our models today. 
I've mentioned before that far from being the dense forest of osteoderms often adorning titanosaurs in popular reconstructions, the actual number found, for example in Alamosaurus, is pathetic. So it's important to understand that when you see entire midline rows of dermal spines in Diplodocus, it is a kind of extrapolation in a similar vein. Of course, please share if you know of updated studies proving this. Interestingly, Cherkas concludes his article by stating that based on this finding, future restorations should take this evidence into account and add dorsal midline dermal spines at least in the tail portion. And this, of course, is now the case. Morphologically, the largest spines were about 18 cm, or 7.1 inches tall. That means for 1 to 35 scale, they should be about 0.5 cm, or 0.2 inches tall. The tallest caudal spine is I believe this one, which just so happens to be half a centimeter long. Incidentally, I believe the tallest of all is the dorsal one here, at 0.75 cm or 0.3 inches, representing 26 and a quarter centimeters. But it's a reasonable assumption that they could have been larger dorsally as we move up. Also, the individual sauropod in association was estimated to be only 14 meters long. Now, these dermal spines varied in shape, with some being conical and some mediolaterally compressed. In our model today, there are at least two that I can say are more conical. With most of them being mediolaterally compressed. Their apices range from straight pointed to recurved, and in this model, we do see that some are straight, while others are recurved. Now, of course, all this could be one happy coincidence rather than design. We also expect real animals to have all kinds of variations anyway, but it's just fun trivia. And with that, let's get to comparisons. For our first comparison, let's compare them in pairs to help you decide. Now here's the brown versus the green together. The brown against the blue. And the blue against the green. Now all three together. What a nice trio they make! And I think it's a good idea to use heat treatment to attain slightly different positionings for the tails and necks. In my opinion, the green is the most natural looking. The brown is reasonable as disruptive camouflage, though some might feel it a bit stylized. And the very dark blue could just be a melanistic variant. I will say I've noticed that in almost all Haolongku's offerings, whichever you have for a while tends to grow on you. So don't regret too early until you have yours for a while. Now begging the next comparison is definitely the Rebor Diplodocus. This is probably the biggest contender for your affections, if we're talking 1 to 35 Diplodocus. I'll say right off that this to me is a very beautiful model, and nothing jumps out as being superior in the Haolongku in terms of accuracy, as far as we can use that term. 
in terms of posture, there's a slight upslope in the Haolonggu, with some considerations I've mentioned briefly in the PNSO Maomen Seesaurus video. While the Rebo has the more traditional horizontal attitude, which is by no means invalidated, we just don't know for sure. In fact, if you ask me, I personally prefer this one. As far as length, both are about the same, though through central estimates for the Haolongku is 86 cm or 34 inches or 2.8 feet, and the Rebo is 83 cm or 32.7 inches or 2.7 feet. In terms of volume, the Haolongku is more bulky. Now here are the heads in profile. To me, the premaxillary portion in the Rebo looks to be a bit too thin and could be a bit deeper. The Haolongku though has that peak due to a presumed soft tissue in the nasal area. If you're like me and can't paint to save your life, these dermal spines would need work in the Haolongku. And I feel leaving them in the same colour actually works for Rebo. And here you can compare the pattern and colours in the Haolongku. Against the more subdued, conservative colour in the Rebo. And plain as it is, you see some faint, subtle markings here, which really gives it believability for such a large animal. The Haolongku is in one piece, so it looks seamless, although the compromise has been claimed to be those cracks that I've showed you before. Provided they don't affect structural integrity, you could take them to be natural skin cragginess. The rebore comes in three parts, so it has seams. I don't mind except over here, now mine has become loose, so the weight of the tail causes it to sag, exposing a split here. If you wanted a one piece anyway, you could just glue it, and it will look great. Shipping should also be cheaper for the rebore because of the smaller size box. Now one selling point of the Rebo is the articulation. I'm comfortable to go side to side, though you could also adjust up and down. The tail is ridiculously poseable, and what this then lets you do is have multiple models all looking like different individuals. And that's an advantage to me if you want to herd. Now just some detail. There's more regional differences in the Haolongku, while the rebore is more homogeneous. The size variations seem to accord more with the points I mentioned earlier. But rebore does have some nice detail. They've included plenty of wrinkles, and then tiny bead-like scales inhabit each of these spaces. My armor can contribute to the illustration. In sum, I'll say that the Haolongku is a beautiful model, but if you get or have the Rebo, you'd have a Diplodocus to be very happy and proud to own. And finally, just to show you how beautiful each of them are, both of these poses are so good, with more flexibility in the Rebo to mimic some of your favourite poses of the neck and tail. Next is my first serious Diplodocus, the original Carnegie Diplodocus. The length of it still dominates my sauropod shelf, and you see in the Haolongku a spiritual successor of that model. And speaking of green, we have here the wild safari Diplodocus. It looks very stylized, but I really do like the pattern and colour scheme, not to mention the form of this model. There was actually an updated Carnegie Diplodocus, and here's a quick look. Then we have another quite popular Diplodocus, the Eofauna Diplodocus. I personally found it too small for my liking the base of the neck too thin, and I wasn't a fan of the silhouette. 
a quick comparison now to show you all three reconstructions. And leaving the Diplodocus now, we get to the one that really started this happy journey for me, the Haolongku Apatosaurus. Now remember this was a time when hopes for 1 to 35 large sauropods were all but dead, and this model revived them. Look at the different builds of the two Diplodocenes, which you can appreciate comparing both 1 to 35 sauropods. Rounding out the original must-have trio is the beautiful Haolongku Brachiosaurus. Here we have the very traditional, very retro incarnation of that trio. And here finally, the updated version by Haolongku. What an historic milestone this is for sauropod lovers. And just to show you, there's no need to hang your head in shame if all you had was the Rebor Diplodocus. It deserves to be right up there. Now we seem to have started on a Morrison formation outing, so let's add the Haolongku Kamarasaurus, what I presume is Supremus. What a monster this was. Then the resurrected Brontosaurus. It looks good with all three variants. And now all five sauropods together. And you see how the table is already getting really crowded. I thought it would be fun to compare the epitome of the long sauropod in the west and that of the east in the Haolongku Maomensisaurus. What a delightful dream for a sauropod lover to see the different diverse bow plants of the sauropod clade in 1 to 35. Now throwing another Morrison formation fauna, we have the PNSO Stegosaurus. And for those of you who have the Haolongku Stegosaurus, For the predators, of course, here's the PNSO Wellosaurus. If you'd like a larger Wellosaurus, we could substitute the PNSO Sorophaganux. And just for fun, the humongous Haolongku Argentinosaurus. And finally, our standard comparators, the PNSO Wilson and the PNSO Cameron. And just to celebrate Nano Tyrannus, we'll invite the little guy to the party. So that's it. What a pleasure this new Haolongku Diplodocus was to have and review. Haolongku seems to have come full circle, and as pleasing as almost all their sauropods are, I can't thank them enough. Let me know what you think, and I'll see you in the next video.